Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Huge thanks for invitation for me. It's a great honor to be in this audience. And it's really pleasant to see so engaged and inspired nurses. Without you, doctors can't do anything. And I always say that a nurse is the most important person in a hospital. Everything that a doctor prescribes uh, is done by a nurse. Uh, I will be talking about infections control, how it's happening in our hospital, and maybe I'll share some useful information that you can use in your hospital. When we are talking about infectious control, we are talking about uh, in-hospital infections, infections uh, that are related to medical care. It's a global problem that exists throughout the world. First of all, the problem of patient safety. Uh, uh, we know the situation about developed country. It might happen in 6-8% of cases. In uh, high-risk units, in ICU, it may happen more frequently. Uh, as to developing countries, so we don't have these kind of statistics. Of course, uh, these risks are higher, uh, much higher, maybe tenfold higher. In Russia, no, we don't have this uh, true epidemiological data. Sometimes uh, we think that everything is uh, very good, but it's a false feeling. It's very important to understand the risks and to detect them. In the USA, uh, the Center of Disease Control gives this kind of data. Two million patients a year um, develop uh, these in-hospital infections. Uh, and it's 100,000 patients annually. We can extrapolate this data for Russia uh, in relation to the population. If we talk about Comparing facts and figures annually, up to 10 uh, plane crashes happened. And when we heard about this, we remember this, uh, we uh, are afraid of this. And you should, one should understand that from in hospital infections, uh, people die every day. For example, uh, like um, two plane crashes happened. First of all, we know that uh, the most important problem is related to resistance development, resistance to antibiotics. Fifty percent of patients who died as a result of in-hospital infection, uh, they died of uh, their, um, this resistant pathogens. In 2019, uh, there was a challenge campaign how microorganisms changed, how they managed to become resistant to antibiotics. If we look at this uh, red small India, it starts spreading throughout the world. It's the first uh, resistant antigen pathogen. And you can see how this red color will spread. It's a super bacteria uh, without borders. It happens in our country, in our hospitals, throughout the world. We should remember that it's a global catastrophe of the modern medicine. Our patients of immunocompromised patients, they have specific risk factors. Uh, that become them vulnerable to in-hospital infection. Uh, uh, the very disease, leukemia, uh, solid oncology, leads to the fact that a patient can't trigger uh, the inflammatory response. They are vulnerable. And plus, you should understand that the therapy that we give them, chemotherapy, immunosuppressive therapy, and in addition to this, it suppresses uh, the capabilities of the body. 
Patients become vulnerable like uh, naive uh, newborn children. Chemotherapy, and you've seen this repeatedly, uh, it may result in mucositis uh, when mucus layer are, are, are impaired, the skin is impaired, and these natural barriers, uh, they can't work properly. Patients are not protected from pathogen invasion. Every, each of a patient has uh, one uh, device, uh, it's a central line. Uh, some patients may have tracheostoma, gastrostoma, and other devices. It's a entrance for infection. If you are talking about children, it's uh, additional risk. It's very difficult to contain patients. It's uh, their life. They try to go out. They try to go out of the ward, communicate. And uh, in case of children, it's, uh, it becomes more and more difficult. When our doctors or nurses ask about risks uh, of the development of this, in hospital infection, we say that 100% uh, of our patients are in this risk zone. Everyone can manifest and develop this infection. Regardless, all the uh, opportunities of therapy, infection is one of the reasons for death in oncogematological patients. Uh, the mortality rate in the case of sepsis is much higher comparing to non-immunocompromised patients. Uh, we should have the certain strategy in case of uh, prevention in hospital infection. It should be a kind of a plan. But it's not the plan that is important, but compliance is important as well. Adherence uh, of uh, what's happening in the hospital. If we imagine our patient who is in the center, there are difficult, different ways how can we influence patients. First of all, uh, the environment the patient in, personnel. Uh, who contact with the patient. One patient every day contacts uh, with 14 different employees. There may be nurses, consultants, uh, doctors, 14 different people uh, communicate or get in contact with this patient. Naturally, uh, these are uh, foreign devices, antibiotics, that are admin prescribed by doctors. The majority of all these important points, uh, nurses are a major part of this. Without nurses, preventive measures can't be relevant and important. If we talk about further on, I'd like to highlight the most important points. As to environment or the setting the patient in, first of all, uh, the ward of a patient, personnel who uh, get in contact with the patient. Uh, we interact with patients. It's our hands. And it's uh, the cornerstone in the prevention of the in-hospital infection. And then comes uh, containment of a patient. If we know that the patient has pathogenic uh, sustainable flora, it's very important to contain the patient and to treat uh, the surroundings properly. And also the quality of air, water, and food that patient is given. As to personnel, the important points, there are important points that we sometimes underestimate. It's a safety culture. Now it's been paid a great attention. We are wrongly think that a patient, if a patient is in hospital, the patient is safe. We underestimate risk factors. 
that a uh, uh, patient is exposed to when he is in our unit. To implement these ideas, so this strategy, multidisciplinary team is very important when doctor specialists of different areas of medicine, when they hear each other, when surgeons, uh, intensivists, hematologists, uh, they interact for the sake of a patient. It's impossible if we don't involve nurses in this team. It's uh, nurses are the most important people in a hospital. For this to become possible, we need certain algorithm, algorithm of uh, these or that procedures, critically important procedures, to make it true to implement this into life, education is very important. Control of compliance of this algorithm with this algorithm is important as well. Next, uh, uh, foreign devices. Here. It's important to follow certain principles, how the central line is uh, dressed. It shouldn't depend on the day of the week, on the time of the day. It shouldn't depend on a certain kind of a person. It should be a certain behavioral model that everybody follows. If you know this, and it's very important to work together with the clinical epidemiologists. If you know the incidence rate of this complication uh, in the department, if you don't know the incidence rates of catheter-associated infections, if we can't follow up the dynamics from year to year, from department to department, it's important to have a person who uh, follow this up. So, if we are talking about the cleaning of the hands, of course it's important to pay attention to several aspects. First of all, presence of good antiseptic, it's alcohol antiseptic, usually 70% solution. And the staff should understand when and how we should clean hands. Besides, parents should be aware of, of that, because usually some of them don't even know that they need to wash hands and we need to explain, we need to teach the parents how to do that. So in our clinic, those are the real pictures from the clinic. We've got such pictures. I think those are very expressive pictures that demonstrate that the hands are dirty because they're contaminated and we explain to the parents that we need to do it very well. And the door of the ward when we put special sign that it's important to wash hands. And of course we've got special standard and algorithm how we need to clean not only to put some antiseptic agent but we need to do it correctly and I'll also show those are the hands in our UV lamp with low recent agent. So actually the cleaning was not so bad. But those are those blind zones, those dark zones. And of course, if the quality is better, we can see a better picture. All the surfaces are even. That is correctly cleaned picture. That is when this cleaning is correctly uh, produced. So if we have at least one UV lamp to have some courses, to have some teaching, to have some education, it's very, very demonstrative. Of course, we need to understand when we need to clean hands. It's not enough to clean it only before and after patients. There are five minutes of cleaning. And the World Health Organization has established it. That's what we need to use in our practice. And I'll just repeat it once again. First, before contact with the patient, before aseptive manipulation, even if you know that you will put on gloves, because gloves do not replace this cleaning. After the potential contact with biological liquids, after the contact with the patient himself, after the surface surrounding the patient, and if the first two are obvious for us, what is 
the contact with the surface surrounding the patient. So everything around the patient, one, two meters around the patient, those are highly contaminated surfaces even in the absence of patient. And we know that this res resistant agents can live there for a long time. And that's how it looks like in real life. Well, actually, nowadays, our physicians do not do that because they understand that it's very significant. It's possible to have such a contact when they touch something around the patient. They don't really uh, realize that it's potentially contaminated contact. After that, they can approach the next patient know some uh, touch the dressing or the drainage bottle and this is the contamination independent contamination we couldn't even surveil it that's the spreading of this pathogenic flora and that's an interesting moment it's very important to check what compliance you've got how your staff really follows the recommendation. In 2016, we had this research on hand washing compliance, and we actually found out that nurses are perfect in compliance. You can see it, the gray columns, those are the nurses. They have the highest parameters, 92% of general compliance before the contact with patient. It's almost 100%. We were happy to see that. And physicians, as you can see, had worse situation. But the worst situation, the blue column, shows the interns. Those are the new doctors. They know nothing. They weren't taught anything. It was our failure. After that, the infectious control changed their tactics and we started to, to avoid uh, letting those doctors get into the clinical department. So they were studying, they were using the algorithms before they go into the actual clinic. And after that, we had another, uh, another research. So pay attention to the blue columns. Everything is much better. And of course, it made us happy. In physicians, it also became better and including the surgeons. But look at the gray columns, look at the nurses. It became worse. And of course, we grew sad when we saw that and we understood why it happened. Of course, within those two years, people change. So some of them get fired. So those courses, those classes, they must be uh, just ongoing. We cannot fail to miss one year dedicated to some problems. It was very important for us. It was a very important criteria for us when we calculated. We understood that it's very important to do it all the time, even with the best known people. We need to continue those classes. Of course, we are talking about cleaning hands, but also we need to understand what the appearance should be. So the nails should be very short. They, there shouldn't be any polish on them. Of course, it's forbidden to have any artificial nails because it was proven that it's accompanied with massive colonization of pathogenic flower, with uh, staphylococcus, with uh, and also on the wrist, there should not be any jewelry because despite our wonderful cleaning, if they have any bracelets, any rings, it will be absolutely inefficient. And that's another picture. So it's it's an artificial photo. Don't be afraid. We demonstrated just to remind how important it is to follow all the moments in appearance because you could put on the best costumes, caps and masks, the best gloves, but to do it wrong. And that's very important to remember that if you need to put on all the safety things, 
for example, while uh, pr while carrying out some septic things, you need to close your nose, you need to get rid of all of the hair, so you see also a ring, a bracelet, it's completely wrong, and of course, it's to remind you that you should pay attention to that also. That's the example of our real practice, what is going on in our center. That's the result. We have found out some resistant pathogen. It was um, mesocillin resistant MRSI. MRSA, I'm sorry. So when the infectious control gets the information from the laboratory, we put the sticker when we write down that this patient should be isolated, that we need to carry on such measures to decolonize. We send this information to the nurses, usually to the uh, chief nurse, so she gets the information. Of course, she has laminated uh, already saved charts and they put those charts on the door to remind everyone who wants to enter the ward you can see the doctors who have put on everything necessary to enter the ward and I need to remind you that it's very important it's more about physicians but also for nurses to be aware of it how important it is to look for the patient who are colonized even without any signs of pathogenic agents because they can be a risk for the other patients. That's how our chart looks. Uh, it's contact aerosol isolation. It's very easy to do. We've done it. We just gave it in the department. Just we say uh, just just have this chart and they do it and everyone needs only to follow all the recommendations, our rules. As for the safety of the patient's environment. It's very important in the clinic with immunocompromised patients. It's very important to follow the quality of water and air. Of course, we're talking about special ventilation system in words. Hyperfiltration is ideal. Of course, it's not always possible to do, especially in some old clinics that were built many years ago. But at least we need to remember, we need to do it all the time some building, some construction works because it will happen all the time and the dust, the dust uh, that can uh, contain some asbestos, it can also contain lots of uh, fungi and of course for our patient it's a catastrophe if they have invasive mucosis and if you know that there will be some construction, there will be some drilling, you should take, uh, you, you should pay special attention and of course it's better to have it in advance when you're planning some drilling. They understand the logistics, the patient will have everything is isolated. You put a special curtain that hides possible dust from the patient and Patients are directed not to pass through those uh, construction. And also, we remember about some special filters the patients can use. And if they need to go somewhere, they can put on those masks, those respirators to protect them. And of course, the nurses need to know about that. And if you, they see some engineer, some plumber to do something, they must stop him at once and be sure that it's completely safe for the patient. As to the patients in neutropenia and immunosuppressive therapy, we are talking about highly contaminated objects. Everything that can contain, first of all, elements of soil, flowers, any flowers actually, because those are highly contaminated gram negative pathogens objects and also different fungi. So it's, it's, it's very important to take into, into consideration. So also to, to do that to fulfill our well strategies. Of course, we need to work out special algorithms. 
also soaps they are called. We need to control the following, not only the nurses, but also the physicians and interns, of course. It's very important. To do that, we need to educate, we need to have master classes, we need to have some tests. And it is possible to do that in this case. Also, we move to the safety of manipulations. What is the most important uh, to the patients? The most important, and I've got this gradation here, 1A. It's proved by many, many well-planned researches. The most important thing is to work with aseptic devices. It doesn't matter what gloves you've got on. It's not even important if they're sterile, sterile or not. The technique is important. And this aseptic technique is proved to be the most important thing. And I want to say another thing. It's very important uh, in, in different aspects, but including Lots of people who have heard about a big problem in Blagoveshensk. It's a hepatitis C infection and infected children. Of course, there are risk and hammer contact infections. And there is the recommendation that is also very important to apply, never to use one sprinch for different patients. Even if you replace the needles, it's very important. Of course, we live in the modern time, and it seems that we are well equipped with uh, these disposable devices, but different things can happen, and it can lead to those horrible results. As for our patients, we have got another factor. It's minimization of invasive uh, manipulations. We avoid doing what we can fail to do. For example, intramuscular injection, taking blood from finger. For example, those are patients with leukosis. So our patients we work with. So that's the patient. I don't know if you can see it well, but he's hygmona. So the, that patient has abscesses after the manipulations where it were not necessary. He must have had central line and he had to have all the treatment there. It's very important to remember. And also, minimization of risks is try to minimize the unplugging of central line, the catheter system, because every approach to this catheter is the risk of antiseptic lack. So if this joint may be sometimes uh, not very clean hands and every time leads the patient to high risk. Try to minimize your indications. For example, prolonged antibiotics and administration, it's very important. Also, it's very important to control the central line and to clean it correctly because it's a most frequently used device and patients are in colossal risk, those patients with the catheter. So that's how I wanted to show the patient. He was less than one year old. It's a very old catheter. It's a plastic catheter. It's not even some special material. It was... Uh, so we had four different gram-negative pathogens. It's the colossal problem that is underestimated by physicians, by nurses, by the medical personnel who work with those catheters. And of course, the difference is colossal between what you must do when you do it with the correct technique as for the correct technique, we've already had a wonderful re uh, presentation about prevention of catheter-associated infections. Of course, you need to have different algorithms, and you need 
to communicate with children who, with catheters. Only the personnel who is able to do that, only a very well-educated personnel must be uh, must work with those patients, the people who know how to do that. Of course, a very important thing is to have the central line when it's only necessary, when the patient really needs it dramatically. Of course, if the patient doesn't need it, you need to remove it immediately. We need to take in a memory that we prefer. If it's possible, it's better not to puncture femoral veins, uh, especially here we don't talk about uh, dialysis catheters because a uh, groin area is very highly contaminated and it's uh, related to the high incidence of complications. Surgical technique is very important and of course for uh, central line we use 70 percent uh, alcohol containing antiseptic or chlorgexidine. Uh, it's uh, preferable to use transparent dressing uh, uh, where we can see uh, the changes in the placement of the catheter or if we see a hyperemia or discharge. How is happening in real life? Once in summer, we face an outbreak of catheter-related infections. The pathogen was uh, cultured from the blood. It was 14 patients of the age up to one year. It's a gram-negative pathogen uh, with a severe resistance to antibiotics. We started to investigate, we started to find uh, the source of these complications. Oh, we examined 500 different samples, mostly liquids, uh, uh, namely different solutions, antiseptics, uh, dispensers, all the surfaces, everything was examined. In two places we found this microorganism, we proved it. it uh, the first place was uh, the table of a procedure nurse, and we found in two uh, uh, two uh, cans, two bottles. So we uh, find this in uh, on the gauze sterile gauze in the sterile solution but they can be contaminated. When we examined uh, the hands of the nurse, we saw long nails, uh, dirt under the nails. It was summer, uh, uh, people, they uh, were gardening. All these factors, we have to understand them as risk factors. For us, we decided that the source of contamination of this patient, of infections, infection of this patient, were the hands of the personnel and uh, non-compliance with the antiseptic procedure. Once again, I'd like to show the case. It was happened in a re uh, ICU. The patient was uh, with uh, isolated uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa. All their medications, uh, uh, they were not active. Only cholestin uh, may uh, act on this pathogen. Uh, when we isolated this pathogen, the patient was incurable. He died in ICU. Later, everything happened, was happening uh, in different wards. Uh, the patients were not in one ward. Two other patients were admitted at a different time and we isolated the similar pathogen, the similar uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
with the with the similar profile of resistance. This patient was up to the 6th of August in ICU. On the 5th of August, we isolated from blood uh, the pseudomonas aeruginosa. On the next day, the patient died. We started to investigate late, uh, further on. We started to detect the reason. Uh, we found two Lossy in the ICU. It was uh, the um, sink pipes, one in the room uh, of preparation for preparation of the enteral feeding. It was uh, the sink of the procedure room and the sink located in the ward where patient was. Uh, then we did uh, genetic sequences of the pseudomonas aeruginosa. In the red, we see the cluster is the similar pseudomonas aeruginosa that was isolated in ICU. And it was an outbreak where several patients uh, suffered. When we started to investigate what were the reasons for this, situations. So we detected uh, the non-compliance with the rooms, uh, with the rules of uh, behaving in the wards, uh, how to treat, uh, how to wash hands. Uh, we have to wash hands, we have to scrub up hands while entering the ward and exiting the ward. And we detected incompliance uh, while working with the central line. When we talk about the fact that we have dissembled the system, disconnected the system, we have to um, apply antiseptics, alcohol containing antiseptic, for 15 minutes. We have to treat uh, the connection place in real life. It may be just uh, spraying of uh, antiseptic aerosol and it's uh, not workable. Uh, there and it happened you during three seconds and then uh, very quickly the medications were introduced into the central line. We are talking about the fact uh, that when we do um, apply antiseptic, we have to wait for a certain time of exposure so that uh, this procedure is to be effective. Sometimes we don't understand what the antiseptic is when uh, a person can put on sterile gloss, uh, gloves and then touch something that is not sterile. It's the a breaking of the main rule when we don't comply with antiseptic rules. It's, uh, I have demonstrated this, how this can influence the life of our patients. In brief, the importance of disinfection of tools, uh, storage, sterilization, it's a very important point and also the disinfection of the surfaces and equipment and, for example, the elements that are in contact with different patients, for example, cuffs of the tonometers, uh, probes of ultrasound devices, stethoscopes, and so on. It's very important. Pathogen, uh, they are present on the surfaces for a long time. Pseudomonas serraginosa may be on the surface for a year and a half, and it's very important to treat the surfaces properly so that to create safe environment for our patient. Uh, sanitary bacteriology helps us in 2018. We conducted more than 2,000 uh, studies to find out uh, the effectiveness of our disinfection procedure. Of course, we control everything, started from the quality of air and uh, finishing up to the cleaning procedures. For example, in 2018, in two-thirds of cases, we didn't isolate any microorganisms. Uh, in 40 percent of cases, we detected something. The majority was gram-positive flora. This is presented in blue, uh, mostly their skin uh, epidermal, epidermal streptococcus and so on. 
30% it was gram-negative flora. If you look at the spectrum of what we managed to find, it was Eudaimonas aeruginosa, Atinectobacter, Klebsiella, all these important pathogens, important for hospital. Uh, they do influence our patients. It's very important to do all these procedures. It's uh, what we've done for patients, for their parents, all these sleepless reminders, this special tables uh, to prevent contamination by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Mostly the sinks are contaminated with this kind of pathogen. Uh, the simple thing is just to move away uh, the uh, tap so that the uh, pick of the tap, tip of the tap, so that uh, uh, water uh, won't go directly into the drain. In addition, in the wards uh, where we know the patients are, are contaminated, colonized with the pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, they are located, uh, we do thermal disinfection, running hot water once a week. And of course, it's prohibited to wash uh, uh, vegetable, fruit, uh, dishes in these uh, sinks, not to contaminate uh, the, the tubes. After the outbreak of this uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa infections, we bought uh, new siphons and new valves uh, for uh, sinks. Uh, these are the steps that were undertaken to prevent the infection. In conclusion, I'd like to stress once again the importance of this multidisciplinary approach. It uh, should come from top to bottom. Uh, from the senior doctors, uh, from the president, from the principal administrator of the hospital, for them to understand that uh, um, nosocomial infection, it's uh, the catastrophe that may happen. Uh, the role of nurses is uh, extremely important, colossal in all these uh, things. When we prevent uh, the hospital-acquired infection. Oh, without understanding of these problems, without knowledgeable, we can't uh, move forward. It's a kind of a round table where everybody listens to everybody, listens to everybody and understands everybody. If you have worked out uh, these algorithms, it's a screenshot from my computer when we uh, upload uh, these algorithms in uh, the uh, resource. Uh, when uh, you enter the folder, we have more than 100 algorithms, how the substances are to be diluted, how to work in a laminar um, cabinet, how to dress catheters. Your colleagues are to have the access to this resource. Once again, I'd like to remind you that everything needs to be controlled. In our hospital, we control, and even we made such kind of uh, boards uh, that say, Infectious control watches you. I think uh, uh, maybe a video surveillance may be not very important, but it may be helpful for you to see what's happening uh, at weekends in the evening. It's important not to punish people, but to explain. No one from employees uh, want to um, bring harm to a patient. If we do this, uh, we do this unconsciously, uh, not, on pur not on purpose, because we undervaluate uh, risk factors. I hope that you will be successful in this and uh, all patients will be happy and healthy. Questions, please. I have a question. Thank you very much, Galina. Uh, the question to our colleagues uh, I have a question uh, a year and a half uh, six months ago uh, we were in European some European hospitals uh, we have different sanitary rules in Europe they are completely different 
completely drastically different from our point of view. Now I am talking about routine washes from the surfaces, from the hands, uh, treatment of air. What's your attitude to this? Uh, in uh, uh, Europe, they don't do these swaps. Uh, what's happening in uh, the US? Uh, what's your attitude to this? Uh, in Europe, the places may be different. I have own job training in Germany, and much attention is paid to um, swaps from uh, the surfaces. Uh, it's made. It's not just done for a certain protocol. It's not for reports. It should be done for self-control. For example. Uh, treatment uh, of surfaces, how it's done, qualitatively or non-qualitatively, antiseptic, does it work or it doesn't work. It should be done on routine, as a routine. It's sanitary bacteriology. It's a very important part of infectious control in hospital. <coughs> So I would say your talk was excellent. I agree with absolutely everything that you said. It was very, very good. What I would like to know is that the bacterial counts throughout the hospital change regularly, and that there's differences in colonies from one hospital to the next. So you may have certain colonies that other hospitals don't. And so what we routinely do is survey every month and get a report on the changing colonies that come and go for our facility. Uh, doctors say that it's very important to do. <laughs> I say that our colleagues, it's very important. It's very important to uh, follow up the dynamics, uh, the bacterial colonies uh, that were isolated from year to year, from month to month. Uh, uh, it's very important to do. And the same happens uh, with the reports, uh, with forwarding reports with assessment of the situation. And I'd like to it, as Jane said, they do this every month. It's a routine practice. Uh, but how to treat uh, cuffs and thermometers and uh, uh, these thermometers? Uh, we use uh, alcohol containing antiseptics. It's a uh, rapid disinfection. Uh, these small surfaces, uh, they may be treated very quickly. Exposure is very short. And coughs and thermometers uh, in the same way. Yeah? And does it work? Because uh, coughs for of thermometers, uh, they are from textile. Uh, I think in our hospital the same thing, we're monitoring, it's infection disease control that monitoring is in the hospital and every month we get a report what's happening with, with diseases and infections in the hospital. But I think what also you told about this is about adherence and adherence is so important I think also for the healthcare providers and for the nurses and something we do in our hospital is like at some day it's unannounced you get some follower at the morning and he checks everything on you, he checks your hands, he checks your nails, and they follow you the whole day, and they check every procedure, what you're doing. It's not a camera we put on, yeah. but it's somebody that follows you. And at the end of the day, you get your report, and they say what you could improve, it, or what is not so good, so and then you have like a clinical monitoring on yourself, and it's to improve yourself, and that's an a very important thing to do. It's not like punishing, but it's yes. improving your skills and keeping adherence on the disease control. I think this is a very important thing because I work in hematology and we are like crazy about infections. So. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much, Johan. Значит, а какая это клиника? Я не знаю, это где? А, например, в госпитале Бельгии, в отделении гематологии, там даже... Не просто камера, а 
In hematology, there are not just uh, cameras. It's a kind internal audit. A supervisor comes who works uh, with the person, uh, who follows the person from the beginning up to the end of the day. And to the end, uh, the report is being made uh, and comments are introduced. What to improve in your routine? What shall be improved? And it's done not for punishment, but for the improvement, for reduction, risk reduction that our patients are exposed to. Uh, I, I, I would just dream about this situation so that we have such amount of manpower to, for control, for audit. How frequently, uh, according to your experience, it's necessary to change disinfectants, for example, for surface treatment, once a year, once in seven, seven years? Oh, that's a very different question. Actually, we do not change the solutions. Yeah, of course, there is a rule that we need to, to have some rotation for the solutions. So we used to communicate with Robert Koch institution in Germany, and we had consultation if we needed to do that. It wasn't obvious, but actually in German, it's not in practice, so I would like to ask colleagues from Belgium and from the US, but we decided not to do anything like that, because actually we have this microbiological control, and uh, we uh, analyze what is going on on the surface. We think it's more important than changing the solutions. Only now we started to have special tests on studying this antimicrobial activity against some special, uh, some special agents. We are not ready to say anything on the data because they were fresh. But we are going to see what results we will have. And it looks quite OK still. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It's very interesting for us because we're dreaming about such work in our inpatient clinic. And I've got this. Uh, this question about those guidelines, SOPs. Uh -huh. SOPs. So personally, I, as a hematologist, because I am a physician, first of all, I'm a cliniticist. I know it from the inside. And uh, the chief nurse and also epidemiologists who know more about the peculiarities that can have in the prevention of infection. We sit together when our algorithm, for example, on central line or port system is ready. We have this council, we have this team. Those are very responsible nurses, we know them. In special departments, our anesthesiologist, our head of ICU unit, and all together in our team, we discuss the details. And when everyone uh, gets to some approval, we get give it to our so it turns out that each clinic has its own algorithm for itself. So we have a very big country. Is it possible to have them uh, unified, to have something in common? Because it turns out that each clinic has its own algorithm. And when some authority comes, he or she says that you are wrong, you need to do it this way. But we can change the rules every time, every month, every year. It's a very difficult question. Actually, it's a good question. I dream of having these guidelines, clinical guidelines that can be common. But we faced the problem. We already have some uh, check from the authority. And when they saw our algorithms, they had very many 
problems because our algorithm cannot meet all the requirements because they do not understand some moments in working with immunocompromised patients. And when we told them what we do with these or those uh, drugs of these or those devices, when we explained what we were doing, there were lots of complaints and they said okay write down some instruction if you think that it should be some special and you need to handle it to be approved to special institution in Moscow and it should have the status it should get the status like uh, this unified instruction but it's almost impossible I don't know what to do so actually, that's what we do. That's how we work. We have done something. Maybe one day we will be able to do something. So when uh, this Russian authority gets uh, there, they actually they are pleased to see those SOPs. We share this experience. We show them those SOPs. But when they come once again, those are not only complaints, those are fines, and the fines are quite large. So we are looking for this happy medium. Either they have some unified or they should not exist at all. Who can help us in that? Maybe we should have them. Actually, it's not a question to Galina Gennadievna. Colleagues, Johan, uh, you want to say some? We deal also in Belgium, like we had like national guidelines uh, that we needed on infection control. So what we do now is like we uh, we have a Belgian hematology society, and it's a society with hematologists and the nurses, and we write together these SOPs, and we present them to also to the politician and to the political landscape, but also to the hospitals, and we make like agreements on it. So that we have common guidelines, so that everybody is using at the same time at the same place. Mm -hmm. So, and that can help you. But it's it's a long process. Yes. I know. I know. Yeah. So the colleagues said uh, that they have some special. Some, some special services. Actually, soaps are uh, very, very peculiar. There shouldn't be any unified. So actually, the principle of SOPs is the individualization of the process. Those are there are algorithms. We study them in our nursing education. There are some special requirements uh, from the authority. But as for SOPs. We haven't introduced them yet. We don't know how to write it. We have the structure, but no one understood what we need those points for. What's the competence of the uh, of, of the institution? So I think that we need to develop in every institution. Uh, it's not correct as our healthcare uh, ministry decided, but I think that our point of view so far is that we are uh, really we, we have it individualized for each institution okay let's have uh, the, some last question oh, it's a, not a question it's a remark so uh, it's some uh, connection with epidemiological services I want to share our experience so oncology is not only about about oncology as is, but it had a very uh, it has developed very much. And actually, epidemiologists are not specialists in oncology. Try to speak their language, the language of doctors, epidemiologists. So those who graduated from the institutions long, long ago in those ancient ages, 
So if the person is adequate, you can always find the common tongue. We had the story when they didn't understand why PCR worked in a different way, not according to their algorithms from the 80s. But when we just told them everything and we showed them, we invited them to the lab, we put on all the necessary clothes and they saw it with their own eyes and we showed them the algorithm. It was enough for them to convince them that our actions are correct and that's it.